All right, how's everybody doing tonight? It is Thursday, October 28th, uh, 7.35, a few minutes late here. Um, and I hope everybody's having a good night. Um, and if you have a boat out there on the water and you're following live, get out there and take care of it. There are floods coming in. Uh, we were just talking before going live here about the the crazy floods that are coming. Uh, today's low tide was like an average high tide in most places of the bay. So uh, if you are live and you're hearing us right now, please uh, focus on low lying areas and friends and family. Uh, let's work together and uh, and get through whatever tomorrow and the rest of this weekend holds. Um, and so Monday, November 1st, um, is the first day of the CCA Pickerel Championship for 2021 into 2022. You can see the, li or the, the URL scrolling across the bottom of the screen here, ccamd.org slash pickerel dash championship. If you uh, go to just ccamd.org slash pickerel, you'll end, end up in the same place. So I'm going to show you uh, what that site looks like when you get there and how you sign up, talk to you about a few differences from last year until this year and then bring in a bunch of guests uh, and we're going to talk about pickerel fishing and uh and pan fish as well and so when we bring in that screen this is what you're looking for so last year you would have gone directly to the eye angler tournament page all right and that's how a lot of our tournaments work prior to 2021 you'd always go here and sign up here but to create more functionality and and um, make it easier for the user there are additional steps this year um but in the end, it's it's easier across the board to make everything work out uh, for us. So if you end up finding us on the iAngler Tournament app, the first thing you'll see here is uh, that you want to register here at ccamd.org slash pickerel, right? That'll bring you to our website. This you can find on our calendar or directly at the URL below. Um, and there's three different options here. You have the details, you have register, you have sponsor. So these are tabs. Um, and there's all the information you need. Um, Participating in this tournament, you can renew your CCA membership. You actually get a discount of ten dollars. Um, so our normal membership is thirteen dollars. I'm sorry, thirty five dollars a year, um, and it's twenty five dollars if you enter through the tournament. Um, and so we've done that consistently across all of our tournaments. We plan on doing that into the future. So even if you're still an active member, your your membership is not expired. This adds twelve months, and it's a way just to add on to your membership. Um, continue to get Tide Magazine and continue to support our work that we do on behalf of the resource and recreational anglers. So um, we have our sponsors loaded and uh, you'll see tournament starts in three days and 12 hours. That is true. November 1st, people can hit the water and go fishing, but the tournament runs all the way through February 28th of next year. So you can sign up at any point. Last year, it would have started December 1st um, and we decided to add another month this year thanks to the input we got from people that are fishing, some of which will be on this podcast here shortly. Uh, so we have some great sponsors that have already signed up. Um, both gold, silver, and bronze sponsors. And you scroll down here and it tells you how to participate. It goes through the exact steps you should follow um, to create a user account at iAngler Tournament. You can download the app. You're looking for the logo that's right here on the screen. Uh, that app works on your smartphone. And then you'll submit pictures of the fish you catch uh, throughout the four month period of, of fishing for these fish. We'll also communicate with you through the app through email and various other ways uh, to make sure you're on top of everything going on with the tournament because what you see right now is what's going to happen, but we're going to add on a lot more stuff moving forward. So the tournament divisions, this is expanded this year thanks to sponsors, thanks to participation. So it's because of you guys and gals stepping up, participating in this event and supporting it that we can do this. Um, and so we, have the, we took the ex exact existing format and just added to it. We didn't take anything away. We didn't really alter the, the, the multi-year format that we've had, uh, you know, going on. And so we're still, the grand prize here is really the top uh, three fish um, stringer for pickerel. That was won by Chase Savage. And uh, you can see the great award he got last year for that um, from Blue Water Copper Works. Um, first place stringer. I don't have the length handy right this moment, but it was a great uh, job that Chase did, you know, grinding it out, that, out, out there on the water. Um, I saw him recently and he said, man, you added a month. Now I'm going to have to fish more. Well, Chase is a top-notch angler and, and proved it last year with that first-place stringer. Um, Sean Kimbrough, also a top-notch angler um, who caught this this pickerel in the tournament last year, was the longest fish. So those two divisions have, are unchanged. Uh, the second and the third pickerel stringer winners are going to be on the podcast with us here shortly. We're going to add the, the um, participants in. Um, also, with the longest kayak or stand-up paddleboard caught pickerel, and what you do on the website here is you can click on any of these and it'll, it'll give you a, a breakdown of exactly what's going on. 
uh, in that division. Uh, Tochterman's Fly Shop is supporting the, the fly division. If you have not been to Tochterman's, 1925 Eastern Avenue in Baltimore and Upper Fells Point, they have a top-notch fly shop that is just stacked and stocked um, wall-to-wall with everything a fly angler needs. Um, and you got to just head up there and see the folks at Tockerman's. Uh, not only do they have the fly shop, but everything else on the first floor as well. Um, you know, full of, of great stuff if you're in the Baltimore area. Uh, JLS Rods and their light uh, tackle fishing team, the, the light tackle ladies, uh, have been doing all the CCA events this year and, and really showing uh, how many great lady anglers we have out there in the bay. So we hope a number of them will participate in this tournament, and JLS is sponsoring the top lady angler division. Uh, we also have longest youth caught pickerel. So for youth anglers, we're not charging youth to participate. We ask that they sign up for a youth membership, which is free. Uh, so you just have to jump through a little hoop to do that, and that is going to um, our website, The Kids Corner. Um, if, the, if you want to pay for their membership, that's great. We appreciate it, but you don't have to. We have uh, some great supporters that have said we want to underwrite youth memberships to CCA so they continue to do that. Um, you can do that right here. And what we actually can do is if, the, kid, if the, the youth angler has their own email, they can set up their own system on their own phone. Um, if they don't, we can connect them with an adult. And it says that right here now. So you just send me an email. I connect the, the, the youth angler to an adult iAngler account. Um, and then Longest Crappie and Perch are also divisions here. Um, and then new, brand new this year are some tournament Calcuttas. When you register, you can add all of these. They're $10 a piece. Uh, the Grand Slam Calcutta is one pickerel, one yellow, one or yellow or white perch, um, one crappie and one bass. So four different species, Grand Slam, longest of each. Um, and for all these divisions, you enter the fish based on how you caught it. Um, so if you're fishing on a kayak or a stand-up paddleboard, you put it in that division. Um, if you're fishing with a fly, you put it in that division. Um, everything else we sort out for you. So don't get too hung up on the divisions. Um, just turn them in. We calculate your stringers for you, and, and the leaderboard will be live throughout the year, uh, throughout the four-month period. Um, but we basically brought in some of the folks that will be in, in this podcast here shortly to talk about um, to build a tournament committee this year. To bring in some ideas. We threw a lot of ideas around and came up with the best ones. And some of these Calcuttas are the best uh, of, of the ideas we came up with. And so we wanted to separate tidal and non-tidal pickerel because the fishing is so different in tidal, tidal rivers to some of the impoundments. Um, and also lots of folks were catching some really nice wintertime bass. So why not reward them? So these are where you get an option to buy in, to compete against the other people that have bought in. Everything else is, is covered with the basic entry, but the Calcuttas are your chance to, to compete against a smaller group of people, most likely, uh, for some top prizes. And we're continuing to bring in uh, prizes for these Calcuttas and additional uh, pieces of the puzzle here. So, again, lines in 730 in the morning on Monday the 1st, lines out February 28th. Uh, one key thing I want to mention here, and then I'll bring in some guests, um, is that you will need a photo identifier. Um, you can actually see it on Sean's hand here. It was uh, CCA, and maybe it had something else added on there. I can't read. Um, but ultimately, everybody that's signed up prior to midnight on Halloween will receive a message through the system that they have a, a unique identifier that they have to have in all their pictures throughout the year. When somebody signs up after that, they will also get, automatically get a unique identifier sent to them, or they can contact me directly and get it if they don't get it automatically sent to them. And that just gives us, make sure that, that uh, you know, it's one check and balance against, uh, uh, you know, folks bending the rules. Um, so that, that's a, a key important piece of the puzzle. The iAngler system also tells us when you took your picture. Um, and if there's any kind of funny business on the back end of the pictures, the judges have the ability to throw it out. So ultimately, judges have total discretion on how things work with the system. And we're looking for folks to have uh, four months of fun on the water. So without further ado, we'll bring some folks in here to talk about just that. We have Eric Packard, Eddie Weber, David Rudo, and Lenny. There he is, Lenny Rudo, angler-in-chief of Fish Talk Magazine. So a great group of avid anglers here that all helped uh, bring this event to where we are today, um, not only participating last year, promoting it, doing a great job catching a lot of fish out there on the water, but really helping shape um, a lot of the rules for this year and a lot of the divisions and out, out there beating the bushes to drum up support from all the great sponsors you saw on the, on the, uh, on the website. So thanks to everybody. Um, you know, Eddie, you're the new guy. 
I know you that you competed last year, but you're in this year as a uh, as a sponsor, and have, have also supported the uh, invasives count this year. So thank you for that. Why don't you Absolutely. tell us a little bit about uh, your interest in pickerel fishing and, and what you do as an angler? And uh, tell us about Severn River Angler. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to be part of it and uh, really got into pickerel fishing. Got me through uh, the COVID winter last year uh, and just got hooked on these little guys. And uh, I mean, they're they're a fun fight and uh, it's just, just something different. Uh, and you know, it's so unique to have a pickerel tournament. Uh, you know, everyone fishes for uh, rockfish and everything else, but uh, to be part of a, a more unique tournament is, is a lot of fun. So, uh, absolutely. And yeah, I uh, I started my brand Seven River Angler last year just as a uh, to take pride in in more of the rivers. Uh, you know, I'm gonna have some more kind of river based stuff coming out soon, and uh, just wanted to. There's a lot of Chesapeake Bay stuff out there, but to take more pride in uh, the rivers that you fish in, uh, I think it's a is a pretty cool thing so absolutely i think you uh you may have gone fishing this morning on that severn river right i did i did already catching some nice pickerel on there some bigger ones this year at this time than last year so uh, i'm crossing my fingers that'll that'll stay true absolutely that's great well there's a definite dynamic and i think you were one of the ones that was championing the idea between a, a pickerel and non uh, title and non-title pickerel division and i think that's smart i mean our, our title rivers Pickerel are kind of hanging on to the edge of what's suitable from a habitat perspective and water quality and salinity. And they've definitely been up and down um, over the years, uh, very cyclical, and not every river has a healthy population. Um, yeah. They're out there in lots of tidal rivers, um, but there's definitely a focus around the Annapolis area. And we don't want to make an, an outsized impact on these fish in any way. You know, we want folks out there catching them, releasing them. If you know folks want to legally keep a fish and take it home to eat, that's perfectly fine. Um, but we, we want to teach people how to be stewards of the resource and, and realize that these tidal fish, especially, will probably use a little more care and, and, you know, be careful with them. Release them if that's what you're doing, um, because their populations are definitely impacted by a lot more environmental factors than some of the uh, some of the non tidal areas and impoundments where uh, I think Lenny and David, and maybe even Eric, probably have some pet pickerel out there in some of those ponds that they caught last year. So, um, Eric, you were a. Uh, a crappy winner last year. And then also, it's my, I feel funny saying that. You weren't a crappy winner. You were a great winner. Actually, the fish. I'm not a crappy fisherman. I'm a crappy fisherman. <laughs> pardon me. Pardon me. Crappy, crappy, tomato, tomato. I think you uh, I think you have a little prize there that you that you won. A uh, Look at that. Scale model of a crappy, a black, black crappie. Yeah, black crappie. Um, made by uh, uh, Haynes Hoffman of Blue Water Copper Works. Um, that's the same style trophy that the top crappy and the top um, and the top white perch or yellow perch, they're competing, well, the perch is a perch, right? So the top perch, the top crappy will receive that same style trophy that Eric just held up. And uh, Eric, you don't happen to have your bass artwork nearby, do you? Uh, yeah, hang on one second. So Eric is a, is a great artist. Uh, you know, he's already fished over 200 days a year and I guess spends his other time painting. So um, this is going to be a prize for a uh, for the top bass, Calcutta. Um, and so, you know, if you're out there catching those bucket mouths, um, make sure you're in the Calcutta before you go fishing. It's 10 bucks and you'll have a chance to win that uh, that original artwork from Eric Packard. So you've seen his art all over the place. And in fact, um, you can see let me pull back up the uh, the, the page here. So this is our logo for the year. Kind of blurry there. Wasn't ready for that. But that is original artwork that Eric did. And um, this is our new logo for this year. And we're actually going to make it available for where folks can purchase some uh, some shirts and sweatshirts and stuff with that brand on it. So thank you, Eric, for the time you spend uh, donating your art and your talent uh, to CCA stuff and, and lots of other stuff. Um, David and Lenny, um, you guys were second and third stringer last year right down to the end so lenny is the young gun gonna beat you this year or, or yeah. i certainly hope not although i kind of hope so but i certainly hope not i mean we we traded places gosh dave correct me if i'm wrong i think it was five times through the course of the tournament and then we traded places twice in the final two days 
if if I seem to remember it correctly, it's that I was ahead of you the entire tournament, and then you call it this massive pick roll that puts you from like seventh place all the way above me, and then I managed to scrape my way back up on the last day. But yes, it was very very back and forth. Me and my dad were on the water for the last three days of the tournament, and in that time. Yeah, we went back and forth like twice while we were on the water together, trying to take second and third from each other. So that was pretty fun. Yeah, that's, well, that last weekend was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. It was back and forth, back and forth. Although, although, I got to tell you, I've got a couple Packard originals, originals in my house right now, including a pick roll that I won, I think it was three years ago for longest single fish. And after seeing that bass, I don't know. I might have to focus a little more on the large map. <laughs> See, that's the thing. We're, we're trying to not only highlight the diversity of fishing available all winter long. You know, you can fish Maryland and Delaware waters, um, tidal, non-tidal. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different species out there. And frankly, they can all be caught with very similar techniques and very similar uh, you know, tackle and tactics. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But uh, so you mentioned Eric Packard art, and I saw Eric Packard art available somewhere else to support another extremely important cause that CCA is so proud to be a part of. I'm actually wearing my Fish for a Cure t-shirt. So why don't you all, Lenny, Eric, somebody, tell me about what you all are doing for your fishing team and where folks can help you out. I'm going to actually type uh, a banner for you so folks can click the link or find, find the link and support your team. So tell us what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much for bringing that up. So... Team Fish Talk Prop Talk uh, is in the midst of the Fish for a Cure fundraiser right now. And Fish for a Cure is a cause that can't be beat. I mean, period. Like, if there was ever a better cause, I don't know what it is. But the bottom line is all the teams go out there. They all raise money. All this money goes to help cancer patients. And it goes directly to help them. It's not, you know, some amorphous research organization or something that you don't know where it goes. It, it's directly helping these folks out, the, the folks who really need it. And Eric incredibly generously donated multiple pieces of art to Team Fish Talk Prop Talk. He is on Team Fish Talk Prop Talk. He'll be fishing with us, come fish for a cure. Yeah. And these are all right now on Facebook, on Fish Talk's uh, Facebook page. They are all up for auction. So you can check in, you can get them. All you have to do is comment on the, the photograph with your bid, whatever it may be. And uh, I actually, I've already been on one myself because there's some really good stuff there. Wait, I got to know, Eric, which is your favorite of these pieces? Of what, the art? Yeah. Oh, the crab. The crab. The crab is a cool one. There it is. There it is. It For is sure. a cool one. I really like the driftwood. And yeah. Yep, there it is. <laughs> And yep. that's one, and I gotta say, I've already bid on that. And I, don't bid against me, because I'm gonna end up with that piece. I love that piece because we were actually out fishing. Yeah, we were Kobe. With, yes, we were Kobe fishing. That's right. When that piece of wood just drifted by the boat, and Eric was like, "Man, I could, I could make something cool with that," and he did. I just outbid you, Lenny. Oh come <laughs> on. <laughs> Uh, raising some money for a great cause for sure. So the Fish Talk yeah. Magazine Facebook page is where you're looking, and you can see as I, you know, I'm showing it here live on the screen. Uh, there's tons of great stuff. It's almost holiday season, and so it's if you're the gift giving type, these are some tremendous opportunities to support a great cause. Get a, a, a you know tax benefit, I believe, of course. Oh yeah, the, the foundation yep. is a C3, three, right? Yeah. Um, and so also give a gift to your you know favorite angler or friend, and uh, yeah. So hop on over there. And there's lots of other great teams as well. I mentioned the JLS Ladies Light Tackle Team. They're, uh, they're supporting the – or they're, they're leading the CCA Maryland team uh, this year. And uh, it's been a little bit late getting things going, but those ladies are going to be out there light tackle fishing and, uh, and putting up some good fish. So there's a great team there. Um, they convinced uh, Frank Bonanno to take them out on the water as their captain and, uh, and a great mix of folks. Um, ladies that'll be out there representing ladies lady anglers and also helping raise money for this cause so we're proud of to be a part of the fish for a cure we're back to uh to run the catch and release division through i angler and um and the invasive species division so there'll be a 50 cord angle cooler uh and some flay knives and a knife sharpener and some other cca swag for the folks that uh, decide to 
like you guys did last year, go after um, a bunch of invasive species. We did. We did the invasives last year, and it panned out. Yep. It panned out, and, that, and that we 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 hit it on the invasives, and we ended up with the uh, the the slam, mm -hmm. which was just icing on the cake. I mean, it was it was it was awesome fun. It was a great time, and Everybody. you know, like we've been saying, there's just no better cause you can. Bring. Hey, look, who's gonna give you grief for going fishing to help cancer patients, right? Exactly. I mean, this is a free ticket, people. If ever there was a free pass to go fishing, <laughs> this is it. But I'm, I'm just going to say, because I know Dave likes those JLS rods. I'm going to say, Dave, don't you get any ideas now? All right? <laughs> One tournament bumping heads is enough. <laughs> uh, All right. So, David, how did you edge out Dad last year? What was your number one tactic that you used, other than just fishing a lot? To, to really put yourself in a position to, to land some nice pickerel? Um, I think my biggest thing was um, every time I fished, um, if I wasn't catching, I would go to a new kind of zone of the lake. That was something that I found really big, and I will be the first to admit, I am not a tidal uh, pickerel fisherman. That's not my expertise. I'm not very good at that. I don't have a lot of time doing it. But when it comes to the non-tidal fish, that's where, you know, I spent every day last year fishing that pond. And what I found was you can kind of section and you have to learn where you're fishing, but you can kind of section off areas as like zones and there will be hot zones throughout a lake and finding that hot zone for the day or for that time of day, I found was really important is just getting your as many strikes as possible to weed through the smaller fish and get that trophy. And if you're fishing somewhere with as many pickerel as, you know, some of the mill ponds, you will have to weed through 10, 20 fish, but those, you know, 26, 27 inch pickerel are in there. And if you weed through them, you will catch them. So tidal water. I feel like that's, there's the same things happening that's related. There's another dimension at it, right? The tide. So in a lake, you're going to have time of day based on moon and, and some other things, but you have that dimension of tide. So Eddie fish in the Severn river, are you do you like incoming, outgoing, high water, low water? What kind of structure are you looking at and what's your what's your tactics you're gonna use there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh definitely like some high water. It's pretty tough in the winter time. Uh with those, you know, there was last year when there was some negative one point three, negative one point five tides that I mean, I could barely get into spots uh because the tide was so low. So Definitely let incoming higher tide is better. Uh, they, especially in the more fall time, they'll move up into that shallow structure area. Um, in the winter time, you still, even when the tide comes out, you can find them in those, in those uh, kind of more channel areas, uh, more like off dock edges and stuff like that uh, when the tide's going out. Uh, but yeah, title definitely puts a puts a different uh, different spin on it. Well, in, in my experience, that I, I don't have a lot, but when you have, let's say, a high water structure point where you know that a fish is holding, or is that fish just kind of moving down to low water? Do you find that they move up and down the bank? Is it kind of like a deep, shallow thing, or uh, probably more? Yeah, a little bit of that, but then more horizontal along the edges as well. Like, uh, especially more in the winter time, they'll hang out a little bit in deeper water, kind of over those shallow. Like, if it goes from two, three feet to six feet, they'll hang out right on that edge. And uh, sometimes, if you can bring it right across that edge, they'll hit it right, right on that, uh, on that drop off. Um, oh. Or the or the hold right at the bottom of that drop off, and you just gotta. You just kind of kind of bounce it off the bottom. Yeah, ambush predators in, in many situations, I think, would be yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They're they're pretty active right now though, because it's uh, it's cold-ish, but uh, there's some there's some nice fish hitting already. Fantastic, Eric. What have you been up to? You've been you've been out fishing for them. I think I've seen a couple caught recently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on St. Mary's, like I already caught twenty four over there. Um, caught it on edge of a uh, grass bed where it dropped from eight feet down six to eight feet down to. I'd say uh, 12, 13 feet, they're hanging on the edge, um, catching them on um, deep diving plugs, just dragging along. 
in that way. Or I was up also in Smithville a couple of weeks ago, fished up there. Uh, the mill ponds, um, I know you guys, We I fished them a lot during the tournament. Um, they're not very deep. They could be anywhere from six to eight, ten feet deep. And so um, those fish are pretty much, um, like David was saying, uh, you need to figure out where they're at in the lake on that day. What I like to do, my tactic is to maybe throw out a paddle tail and a MEPS, troll along until I hook a fish. And then once I figure out where they're at, then I'll start casting in the area, working it around. In the uh, tidal areas, what I found is I like fish in low tide, to be honest with you, uh, because it takes the water away, gives, constricts them down to a finite area, and I can find them in the channel along a drop off or on a dock, a dock that's right along a channel edge. I like to hang out there as well and catch them. Um, unlike the other guys like Lenny and um, David and some of those other guys, Zach, they cheat a lot. They use a lot of live bait during the whole tournament. <laughs> cheat. <laughs> <laughs> so what I do is I start out using artificials, and then at the end, when I start getting desperate, I'll start putting the minnows under the bobbers and start drifting, and catching that way. So anyway, all right, all right. Well, we had a uh, the crowd <laughs> weighed in here. Uh, open up some betting on Lenny versus David. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that bet. I think it's a good idea. I think that's a great idea, and we're going to figure out how we're going to do that. A Calcutta. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Lenny versus David could be definitely a Rudo Calcutta. <laughs> I, That's think I, like it. I think I like it. I think you should both think of uh, what the other should do mm. for you mm. if they win. Yeah, like, they I want to see a side bet. And if okay. folks want to bet, great. But we don't need money involved. I think we I, need some tasks and some uh, you know various things, whether it be cleaning the uh, you know, raking the leaves. Yeah, or, can I get my, my lawn mode? <laughs> There you go. Mm, can I get unlimited trailering access of the skiff? Yeah, this, this, this. Hey, yeah, I don't know. There might not be a kayak going in the back of my truck anymore. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna have to figure that out. I want you guys to report back on. Uh, we'll see what happens with watching Lenny and, and David back and forth throughout the year. Um, Lenny, Eric says you cheat and use live bait. Um, <laughs> is that your go-to? It is. I, I, you know what? When it comes to pickerel, I'm old school. I'm the first to admit it. I'm the first to admit it. And that's not always the best move. There are days when we're fishing the same lake. We've, you know, Eric and I have fished together many times. There are days we're fishing the same lake. I'm doing the same thing with my minnows and my bobbers, and I'm drifting them around in these areas, maybe super slow trolling them. And he's paddling that kayak, and he's just pulling those lures and trolling great big sweeping areas and there are days when that works better but what i found over the long haul for me personally the way i like to fish man uh, the the minnow under the bobber for the pickerel is just i don't know I, don't, I honestly i don't think you can beat it you know pickerel like minnow there there are it's rare that they just won't eat the minnow you know and like david said you got to call through them you know the the 16 inch pickerel can eat the biggest bull minnow that you can buy like the i mean the honking big you know snakehead destroyer size minnow 16 inch pickerel has no problem chowing on that guy so you will have to cull through a lot of small fish but the big fish man they go for it now i will throw in there that there are certain days usually when the bite is really tough uh, i think it was eric that mentioned the meps earlier there are certain days when that vibrating blade is just what does it. And those are days when they're not eating the minnow. The, those are the same days when they're not eating the minnow. That's normally when those blades are just, that's what gets them fired up. I don't know why it is. I can't make any Heidner hair out of a pattern as far as that goes. And I track, you know, Dave, this is something this whole tournament has caused. I tracked for two years now, every trip, barometric pressure, water temperature, air temperature, condition of the sun, moon phase, I mean, you name it. I've been tracking all this stuff, trying to log it all. And thus far, I've been able to identify zero pattern huh. on, on why they act this way sometimes. But there are days when they totally ignore the minnow and they hit the blade baits. It, it, it happens. I'm actually half curious to hear if, because I've never, I have not been able to associate this on the tidal side. 
This is purely on a freshwater side. I'm curious to hear if, if Eddie or Eric has ever noticed something like this on the tidal side. I've never fished minnows on the tidal side. I've always fished official. Maybe uh, Eddie got anything? Uh, not any patterns. I've fished a lot of lures. I'll have a minnow kind of trailing uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm kind of floating down a bank or something like that. Uh, and I've definitely caught them that way. Uh, but not as many minnows in tidal. Actually, I used a lot of minnows last year. And didn't have much luck. Uh, I had a lot more luck with uh, the X wraps and underspins and like MEPS type spinners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I watching Lenny and Dave fish, um, they're catching quality fish. I, although I caught, I think, seven or 10 um, citation fish this year alone from January to February, but I still couldn't beat them. And they're fishing the minnows. And the minnows, to be honestly, uh, honest with you, is they outfish an artificial, uh, you know, there's just a better better bait for um, pickle for some reason. So if you really look in the wind this thing, you need to throw some minnows, I believe. So that, and like I said, I look at it as, as old school. When, when I was seven years old and my dad was taking me fishing on the Eastern Shore, we always got a bucket of minnow. And it just kind of, man, it, it, it pans out. It yeah. pans out. But but what I found is some of the ponds I'm fishing, if now that we have the largemouth bass portion of it, uh, some of these ponds I'm catching uh, 17, 18, 19, 20-inch largemouth bass, and I'm catching them on paddle tails and on um, shallow diving baits, uh, you know, crankbaits. So if you really want to go after both, you may want to throw artificial. Um, the largemouth will take the, um, the minnow, but – you're going to, more times than not, you're going to catch a pickle. Right on. I just found a, oh, I lost it. I can't do two things at once here. I found some stats from last year's event, and uh, one of them was that, oh, where am I going here? We had 80 people log 366 fish, and 84 of those fish were the uh, citation size or bigger. So 24 yeah. inches or bigger. So 84 out of 366. For citation, um, and then Chase's top stringer was 80 and a half inches, uh, Sean's big fish was 27 and a quarter, and then David's stringer was 78 and a quarter, Lenny, yours was 77 and a half, and then David also had the top kayak caught fish at 26 and a half. Our, our top fly caught fish, uh, Peter Tursick, was 24 inches, and then an interesting stat from Eric, quote, over three months, I traveled 5,988 miles, <laughs> fished 13 different fisheries for a total of 288 hours of fishing, seven citation pickerel, a citation largemouth, and a citation black crappie that is now copper. <laughs> so uh, these are the types of things that this event kind of brings out. And, you know, a lot of folks um, putting the miles on and spending money and, and enjoying these fish, this fishery that's you know, across our, our great state and our neighboring state there in Delaware. So, um, Lenny, you mentioned keeping the records. I think it's important to note that the information we collect in this, we provide to DNR as well. And so we have multiple years now. And what we're trying to do is help them understand through our activities what the population might be. And this exact same thing is exactly what happens with striped bass and exactly what happens with a lot of the species that are largely recreational fisheries. You know, there's a lot going on with striped bass right now, but it's important to note that the data collected by rec anglers now is used to assess the population of striped bass and is used to set everything that happens to them from a mortality standpoint. So you hear a lot of one group versus another about whose fault things are and whatnot. And the reality is recreational angling is at the core of understanding what's happening on the water in fishery science and management. And we always need to do a better job of providing data when asked or developing systems when we can provide data. And this tournament's a perfect example of how we're using technology. Um, it's not going to tell the whole story about what's happening with pickerel. I mean, even Lenny's log, like he said, he can't figure out what makes him bite certain days. Um, yeah. it's, it's just things that'll help you get little insights into what's happening out there on the water. And as a guy involved in fisheries management and a big part of what CCA does, it's uh, that's the intriguing part to me. And you know, frankly, if you just look at it from the enjoyable side of things and going fishing too, like that's a huge win, uh, you know, that we, we can share with each other. So we have uh, a participant 
from the past. Uh, after chasing title pickery, pickerel exclusively for the past three winners, I found that if they're not eating minnows, the bite is simply off. <laughs> we caught a 26 inch, and there is a certain window in which they feed. Well, there you go. And a brand new silver sponsor that came in today, Anglers. Thank you to the team there. Uh, talk about a great place to get bait, whether you're fishing you know, the Anne Arundel County rivers, heading to the eastern shore to check out some of the mill ponds, you know, heading to the north, heading to the south. And there's pickerel anywhere from my home in Baltimore all the way down to where Eric lives in St. Mary's County on the western shore and, uh, and the majority of the eastern shore. So there's a lot of options, a lot of other great bait and tackle shops that are sponsoring us, uh, All Tackle in Annapolis, Tochterman's. Um, and, and so, you know, check these places out and, and all of them have yeah. a total great, a great mix of tackle. Um, so, you know, we talked about MEP spinners, paddle tails, um, what, what else, what else are we throwing out there? I mean, what, what does everybody need to have? Let's go around the room and each one of you, uh, mentioned two things you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't hit the water without. We already talked about minnows. Uh, I want to talk about rigging them before we're done, but Eric, what are two artificials that you, you've got to have targeting pickle? Uh, a quarter ounce jig Kai Tech, um, four inch paddle tail. Uh, the jig head would be a VMC, uh, that for sure. And then a the MIPS spinner, of course, as well. Those two I yeah. definitely drag. Now, colors that you think are best, or is it varied depending on the day? Uh, the paddle tails will be a neutral, probably a gray blue, pinkish color mixed into it a little bit. So it looks like the bait. Uh, four inch, I wouldn't go much bigger. You want it to look like the bait or as in the lake. Um, the MEPS, I'll pull a, uh, something without a bucktail on it. Usually I'll just pull a, uh, silver number four, uh, with a, um, plain, uh, tail on it. All right. Eddie, you're up next. Yeah, probably pretty close to Eric, but, uh, the one thing I would add to my spinners is, or my paddle tails is underspin. Uh, I put underspin on all my paddle tails, uh, white Z-Man, uh, they love that. Uh, that extra extra flash. Um, and then one thing I'm going to try a lot more this year and has some good luck on uh, already is uh, the dart spin, uh, with, which is like a um, – it's a it's a plastic with a spinner off the tail. So you can put a jig head on the front and kind of use it as a paddle tail, but it's got that extra spin off the back, uh, and that's worked, that's worked really well. Um, or that extra wrap – uh, uh, small X wrap yellow perch is a killer. I swore I had a dart spin somewhere around in my office here. I was looking for one. I know I meant to bring one, but th those have been those have been great so far. E even the bigger ones, I've been surprised. I was trying to fish for some uh, some rockfish off some uh, off some rocks and caught a nice twenty plus inch pickerel uh, on it. He slammed it. Nice. Well, and they're pretty tough too. I know a lot of folks have been using them with uh, for snakeheads as well, and I've yeah. uh, been surprised at how well they hold up. I own a bunch. I haven't been able to put them in the water much because I only talk about fish every day. I don't get to go <laughs> as much as I should, but that's the way it is. So, all right, David, you're up next. Two artificials. You can't leave the shore without. All right. So the first one is going to be I honestly same with Eric and Eddie. A quarter ounce jig head paddle tail setup. Um, I did not try the underspin last year. I'm going to this year, so I'm not going to say either or for that. Um, I do like the flash, and my other lore I'm about to say doesn't have flash, so let's just go with underspin for that. Um, my second one is a four-inch jerkbait. I really like to have a jerkbait I can toss around. I think, okay, well, I also fish in the pond I fish has shad, so that's something that you uh, to keep aware of. Like, if you have a larger bait fish like a four inch bait fish basically like a jerk bait you can match it with nice suspending um i like that a lot just because it really mimics the fish and i can troll it too so if i am not trolling my bobbers for some reason like you know maybe it's one of those days where they're not biting the minnows i can troll my jerk bait i can troll my uh, paddle tailor too and then i have you know multiple stuff i can do at once all right last but not least lenny what do you got uh, again, I'm going to stick with ridiculously old school, but first off, a chartreuse roadrunner. That's the artificial that I reach for when they're not hitting the minnow. They love the roadrunner. Uh, and then second item, which I'm tipping with a minnow, is a white bucktail. Quarter ounce white bucktail, 
that yay big, maybe two and a half inches long. I like I like a sort of a big bucktail for them to give a big profile for to interest those bigger fish because it's winter time. They want a big meal in one gulp. And this is a critical component. I drew a little picture. I'm not very good at drawing, but I tried. That's the kind of bobber I like. Okay. <laughs> it's got to have the quill as well as the bubble. Your regular old round bobber is great for some stuff. But this bobber, a couple of feet, several feet above that oh, white bucktail. Time out. Time out. Time out. I'm looking behind you on the wall. Is that one of them? Because your picture was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a popping cork that's left over from the mackerel. Okay. That, was my, that was my hot mackerel rod. Hold on. I got I got my tackle box over here. All right, you find one because I'm going to bring in a comment from a top notch fly angler, Mike Dunlap, uh, it's, and I'm going to mention fly as well because I prefer to catch these fish on fly. So you dig around your tackle box, but fly. Mike is saying a weighted deceiver, white with chartreuse or orange with lots of flash. A weighted game changer as well. A weighted a game changer is a jointed fly that just swims through that water like you wouldn't believe. And I'll tell you, I prefer fly fishing for pickerel simply because you can. You can suspend a fly like it's you know much better than you can suspend any artificial. Um, and there's something about watching that fly kind of come through the water and watching that that pickerel come up and grab it. And I agree with Mike. Um, lots of flash is important. And I like a relatively light fly without weight on it. A clouser is fine, but a deceiver is the way to go. I like tying bucktail deceivers um, personally because they, they kind of pulse. Um, the game changers have a tendency to do that as well. And tons of flash is absolutely right. So did you find one Lenny? I just, for the record, I just want to point out, I never claimed to be an artist. Okay. <laughs> I never claimed, but this is it. That's it right there. Uh, That's the guy. I've seen one of those. Looks exactly like it. I'm going to second him on this one. Those bobbers are like integral. Yes, they're, they are integral. That's right. So the critical component, because here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you have a nice breeze, you can drift, right? When you don't, you got to slow troll. Pick roll, like Dave was saying about finding the zone, right? You can't just go to one spot and fish there. You got to work a whole lot of water until you figure out where the heck those fish are and then pound on it, right? Because they will move around in the lake. What this guy does is when you super, super slow troll this, Dave knows. What does it do? It goes wobble, 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 wobble. <laughs> it does this. That's exactly right. It does this. And just picture in your head that bucktail with the minnow several feet down below it. What's it doing? It's doing this. And that drives them nuts. The pickle. That drives the pickerel nuts. Okay. Okay. So wobble Can the bobber. Wobble, wobble, wobble. <laughs> Can I add on to your little uh, thing about the zones? So – like my dad said, you when they move around a lot and you gotta find them in the zone. But even when I found them in like my zone, I'm still never sitting static. I figured this out after like probably my second trip last year. Even once I've like found my zone, I'm still gonna slow troll. I'm just staying within that zone now and I'm pounding it until I've gone like I won't leave until I've done at least two runs through it where I haven't caught a fish. And at that point, if I haven't, then I'm definitely leaving. I don't want to spend too long working that area because you know we're fishing a tournament. So, yeah, Absolutely. I feel like in title two, they're they're either there or they're eating, and or they're not. Uh, so you you gotta if they were in that creek eating the day before and they're not eating the same right now, move to another creek. Uh, because you know don't don't waste a lot of time thinking. Well, they were here yesterday; they're gonna eat eventually. No, you better. I've seen that it's better just to move to another creek and, and find them elsewhere. I call that ADD. It, 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 it's right, <laughs> right. <clears throat> Milk ponds are pretty manageable because you move around pretty easily. They're not too mostly too large. You can cover a uh, pretty good area in them. What I like to do is I'll put a um, rod holders on, put two rods on with bobbers and those underneath them, and then I'll be like trolling in reverse, and I'll be casting a, a bait in the center between the two and trying to work the third bait to see if I can cover all ground and see if I can catch fish that way. Now, do you use the same kind of bobber as Lenny? No. So I just got to say. I, I might switch up so I can win this thing. <laughs> you need to wobble. So, 
So <laughs> Zach, Eric, you draw a nice picture of the barber he uses. There's like a TikTok somewhere here. I think David, that's your job. You're the youngest one here. I think you need to make a TikTok of, talk of the the barber wobble. Do the wa- barber wobble. Oh, yeah. okay. It should be like a new fish talk thing. I mean, the so Rudo barber wobble. Well, Zach whipped out a new one last year. Ooh, that thing is cool. It, it, oh it yeah. Is. They're yeah, bobbers awesome. that are like planer boards. They track out to the sides. <laughs> and then you just pop it and you can flip it the other way. Like, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to use it to one side. It's like if it's like you know, going too far out, you want to bring it in a little bit, you can just pop it, go back in, pop it again, it'll go back out. You can make it swim throughout the water a little bit. It's actually a really, really cool design. They, they, made, they made me jealous. I had bobber envy for a little while there. All right, hold on. I think I found them. <laughs> let, me, let me get the... The screen. Yeah, here. he can actually. Is this yeah, there it is. For, yep. the there Prowler is. planers? Three ways to rig them: plane to the left, plane to the right, or flip direction and give it a pop when given a pop. <laughs> so these are bipartisan poppers or bobbers. <laughs> I like them. Left, right, whatever doesn't matter. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, there you go. We let Zach's secret out of the bag. If I'm not mistaken, Zach put up a pretty, pretty quality bass last year. So. You know, maybe maybe he'll be back in with this this uh, prowler planer secret. I haven't seen these local anywhere. Does anybody else? I think you had to order them. There you go. Oh, the dark web, I guess. Yeah. You heard it here. This is uh, this happens to be Etsy, and uh, I see some sort of wobble plopper or pop, whatever they're called, poppers. Lots of different options, and. Uh, hmm. I will say that um, I do not know how Sean Kimbrough caught his longest pickerel of the tournament last year, but I know he's a big fan of the float and fly, which is you know just another technique to use a float and a light lure like a fly or a small tiny little one thirty second ounce jig, and really just drive definitely panfish crazy, but pickerel as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't catch uh, some of his best pickerel on that float and fly method. So it's another different a different way to utilize something else in your tackle to present that lore in a different way. And I think especially starting November 1st, ending February 28th, you guys have any thoughts on how your tactics may change over this four month period as different conditions change? You don't have to give out all the secrets, but I mean, come on. Well, we're starting yeah. earlier in the year. So Uh-oh. we're starting earlier in the year. So I think what my tactic is, what I'm going to do is on, I'll be fishing Pianca Tank on the first. So the second, I'll be on a pond over in the eastern shore at the Bucket of Minnows. All right. Eric's going for the win. Swing into the fences. Early. I'm, I'm on strike until December. <laughs> I am. I'm on strike. I'm still fishing <laughs> for rockfish. I still got – I want to catch some sea bass. I got some other stuff going on. But talking about the changes, what, what I found most interesting – I know David will remember this for short. Sure, uh through the depths of winter you're talking the open water the main body the points the edges uh late in the season just as the tournament was wrapping up those fish were getting ready to spawn and it was the headwaters oh my gosh that actually was uh super super defined it was like well one weekend to one week uh we had the fish had been down at one they did not go above this one portion of the pond mm-hmm. the entire time we fished there we never had to go up there and we show up one weekend and we fish our whole portion of the pond and we're like where did all the fish go and then the moment we got above this one point i think the water did get a little bit shallower up there as well mm-hmm. um they were all loaded in there just everywhere mm-hmm. Yep, they went right up to hey, the headwaters for that spawn time. Hey, Lenny, did you uh, notice any difference in the depth during that time frame from the um, below the bobber? It uh, from the below the bobber, uh, you know, I set the bobber so I'm like a foot off the bottom pretty much every time. And like Dave said, when it was when it shifted to the up lake area, it was shallower up there. I think the average depth up there, I'm going to guess, is like you know, four feet instead of six feet, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but we caught them going up once once it bottlenecked to where it was really, you know, there was it was it bottlenecked enough that there was actually a current. Mm-hmm. And and that that was where we found those late, late, late season fish. Or I guess I don't know, do you call that late season or early season? It's February. I'm not even sure. What does that count as? Fishing three hundred and sixty five <laughs> days a year if you're doing it right. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, 
I noticed on some of the ponds so too that um, the fish did move from the dam area, the mid lake to upper lake as the season went on. So December, they were down near the dam, mid lake, um, you know, late December, January, February, they're further up, in, up the lake. Yeah, I think what will be interesting in the title is um, it's they seem to be very active right now and bigger fish than they were last year where the uh, bigger fish, the upper or mid 20s didn't show up until kind of January ish time. And at this time, or actually, I didn't catch my first 20 inch fish until mid November last year. And I've caught three or four 20s and 21s already, uh, where I was catching 16s and 17s at this time last year. So it'll be really interesting if the bigger fish show up earlier. Um, and I think it's it's fun now because it's not brutally cold uh and they're and they're more active and get more people involved early when it's not uh the, the diehards out there um and you don't have to deal with the ice uh i don't know about the mill ponds but uh, a lot of those creeks where i go kind of now till january uh mid january to february a lot of those uh high creeks are are pretty frozen over so uh that makes a, a big difference as well Definitely fishing through the skim a couple of days uh, in the mill ponds. Yep. Yeah. I did Agathy too. Yeah. Yeah. I'll also yep. say if this year's anything like last year and you actually want a real shot at winning the tournament, in all likelihood, you will be out there in the middle of January in 33 degree weather, likely in the rain. So it's, I think it's fun. I think it's like it. versus nature right. and I'm winning because I'm catching fish and it's, it's like, but I'm going anyway. <laughs> well, and the key is safety too. I mean, we live yeah. in an age where you know technology is right in our pocket. There's no reason not to have you know the utmost safety equipment out there on your boat, your kayak. You know, be covered in the right gear. And there's not a single fish or a single tournament or a single win worth uh, you know rolling your boat in cold weather or having those situations happen. So you know, we say it time and time again. Um, use the good judgment and, and, and stay off the water um, or, or fish from shore uh, w when it's cold. And, and these conditions are, you know, the hypothermia is a, a very real threat. So, you know, I want folks to always remember that, uh, you know, safety is more important than a tournament. Yeah. Always wear your life jacket when you're fishing this time of year. Yes. So I always wear your life jacket anyway, if you're on a kayak. Period. Um, yep. but, yes. Yes. <laughs> And I will say if, you know, they're a bit pricey, but if you have the ability to get one, the Mustang float coats, it's a very, very warm jacket with a life jacket built inside of it. Um, I know my dad's had one for years. He uses when he fishes in the winter. I won't go out past. I, 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 mean, I fished off my kayak today and I would have worn it if I wouldn't have been sweating so much. Um, it's a really, really good piece of safety equipment. And if it can save your life. So I would definitely look into, you know, checking those out. Absolutely. Well, I, yeah, what are they called again, David? Uh, they're the uh, Mustang, correct, Dad? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's a Mustang. Mustang. And, and the beautiful thing is, it's a USCG approved life jacket. It is a full on life jacket. But as Dave said, it's super duper warm. Like, you can't find a warmer jacket to buy. So it's really kind of a no brainer. There you yep, go. There you go. There you there go. go. Versions too. I know the one I have has a gasket around the waist. So if I wanted to wear like um, some like dry pants or something like that, I believe I could do that. Um, also, kayak fishermen, if you're going in tidal water, probably should wear a dry suit or even really anywhere. I don't in Johnson's, but I also fished that lake alone once last year in very good weather. And I don't think I would go if it wasn't. I think we just heard a location tip. I'm not going to repeat it, but I, my head exploded. But you know, hopefully, it didn't show. <laughs> I, well, I, I do want to say that I do see some guys out there wearing chest waders with their life jackets, up, and I would say, do not do that. I've known yeah. to get pulled down, so don't do that. Yeah, I can tell you for a fact. I mean, I'm a lifelong duck hunter, and I've been in some tough situations with uh, with with 
waders, um, breathables that are tight fitting and that have a, a waiter belt that kind of seals off your, your waist area. That's a little bit of a different animal than the, the classic rubber or heavier boot waiter. I have a pair of Sims waiters that are just top notch and I'll actually wear them on a kayak without any boots. So it gives you a, they're just light, they're waterproof. Then I'll have a, a waterproof jacket on top and, and life jacket on top of that. So there's a way to do it, but you have to be really careful with the waders. And the number one recommendation I make to people when it comes to this stuff is test it out when the water's, water's warm. Go out there, roll your boat, see what happens, get ready and prepared for if it happens when it's cold, because when, it, when it's cold, that the extra level of shock that's going to hit your body is going to shrink the amount of time you have to react and get, get safe and get back to the shoreline. Um, and so definitely test it out and, and there's no amount of money, you, you know, is, is too much to spend on, on safety on this stuff. So really take it seriously and, uh, and test it out for sure. So we have a, uh, good question from Kevin, Kevin McMenamin from the Annapolis Anglers Club. Lenny is showing you what he's, what he's using there. What is that? That's your little bucktail, huh, Lenny? That's my bucktail. I'm trying to expose the hook so we can see the size. I guess that's like, I don't know. Is that a one on? Might be. That's white. That's yeah. the size right there. And I, I just want to say for the record, I, all of last season, I don't think I gut hooked. I, I may have gut hooked. I may have deep hooked a couple. I don't think any were gut hooked. And it was extraordinarily rare to deep hook using that. Yeah. So I'm looking at my numbers. I think I caught like 360 over the last three years. And I've never gut hooked one. They've always been hooked in the mouth maybe one, maybe in the gills. And what I do there is I'll actually cut my line and pull the bait back through the gill rather than go forward with it to save the fish. I mean, or cut the lure if I have to, to be honest with you. It's no big deal. But um, these fish have a long face, long mouth on them. And you'd be surprised a small, pretty small um, three-eighths ounce jig you can catch them on. Um, and they usually hook them right in the roof of their mouth. I would also argue that, you know, for most of these baits and stuff, unless you're fishing like crazy high pound test to gut hook, if you're not going to be able to gut hook a fish because it's going to bite it and you're either going to hook it in the corner of its mouth or if it goes far enough in its mouth that it's it's going to cut the line with its teeth and it's never going to be able to have a chance to get back there unless you let it gnaw on it for, I can't even imagine how that would happen, honestly. So what, what kind of lead are you guys doing to kind of take care of that toothy critter problem? I use a 20 pound fluoro. I use 17 to 20. Yeah, I've been using 25. I used 15 last year and had to try to do a little bit thinner, but uh, had a decent amount of uh, bite off. So, a leader shy, to be honest with you. I use 17 to 20. Um, I rarely see one bit off. I do catch fish, though, that have baits in their mouths that I take out that they've been caught. Uh, some of these mill ponds are pretty small with a lot of pressure on them. So you get a lot of repeat catches and I catch other people's fish and have seen that because you're probably using like a 10, 12 pound test. That, that brings up actually a really interesting point, Eric, about catching repeat fish. Um, I will say at least, and, you know, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but if I call like, say if I caught a 26 off this one point one day, I, I'm going to go back and honestly like check that area again and see if that fish might be hanging out around there again. Cause he might not, but he also might. And a really good example of this is last year, um, my sister's boyfriend was fishing with my dad one day and he broke off on a fish early in the day and, you know, they left that spot and it came back. It was like four hours later and they caught that fish with his jig in its mouth. So you can catch the same fish twice. And as long as, you know, I mean, totally agree. They've I've, I've, I've got the pictures of that fish. I remember that very well, very well. Same fish, same day. So jig was hanging right in the corner of his mouth. Can you enter the same fish twice, Dave? Yeah, if you catch it on different days. What if you catch it the same day, morning and night? How do you know it's the same fish? Well, if the jig's hanging out, out of its long. mouth, you didn't catch it the first <laughs> no. time. <laughs> <laughs> Although, Eric, didn't you have one that was, like, defective somehow that you recognized? Like yeah. a fin or a tail or something? I actually caught one that I recorded, and then when I caught him again, his tail was missing because he had the bottom half of it missing. This time, the top half was broke off. It was the exact same fish, but I didn't turn him in because he was too short. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom half of his tail cut off. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thanks, bud. Go on. Go on your way. That's great. <laughs> I've done the same thing. I've, I've called the same fish, I think, three times last year within two weeks off this one point. Different trips. Yeah. Yep. Because they have this one scar right on this side that I was like, oh, that's the same guy. Yeah. Some, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> That caught one, um, and it was um, had birth defect. It had teeth coming out of the top of his mouth on on the roof on the outside, and he caught that same fish. I want to say the following year, to be honest with you. Uh-huh. It, it, of course, it's a little bit larger, but it was just bizarre that uh, it not I guess not really though because if you're, like I said, the mill ponds are pretty small fisheries, and those fish move up and down, so you, you're going to catch them over repeatedly. So we have uh, a question about the, the mill ponds. So the mill ponds are more kind of not as much undulation, correct, in, in the depths and not as much drop-offs as a creek would. So how would you fish a mill pond compared to tidal water? They, they are different in depth. If you fish down by the dam, you're going to have, a, you know, may have 8 to 10, 12 feet. When you fish up the headwaters, you may have 3 to 6 feet. And... Um, you're going to be fishing the shorelines and you look for laydowns, look for trees laying down, uh, look for brush, look for, um, if you have, I don't usually carry my uh, meter with me. I know Lenny does, checks water temperature and stuff, but there are um, areas where you'll get two points coming together. It'll neck up, water's pouring through there. It's going to be a little bit deeper, maybe, won't have so much grass. Those fish will be sitting there, fish off those points. Uh, look for lily pads that go off a point out or look for lily pads floating or and flowing, but growing uh, offshore by themselves, and a fish usually hang around there as well. My my personal favorite is finding an old underwater weed bed. Um, that's just like they love to cruise over there. They can hide in a little bit. They'll they're again. I think Dave said earlier they're ambush predators, and they love that. Um, that's my biggest thing, especially if I can find like a point with an old weed bed on it. I'm gonna like totally crush that area i'm gonna fit as far as i can and you'd be surprised i'd throw a wacky rig up there and catch my wacky rigs there you go i'm uh oh one tip from the from the followers here mike dunlap the sunny side of a mill pond in the morning makes a lot of sense without a doubt and they I, want, uh, especially for largemouth bass if you're looking for a big bass i mean bait's going to be up there and the bass will be feeding on them the mill ponds are pretty shallow. Look for any changes. If you're a snakehead fisherman, you know the swirls you see. Large mouth do the same thing on those mill ponds. I uh, I was just brought in a picture from Zach. I was looking for the one with the, the funky teeth if it was in the uh, in the tournament. But this is a fish right at the last minute that Zach submitted on the last day, chasing uh, everybody that put in good stringers. And I just pulled this up because it's a perfect example of not only a cold day. It looked like it was raining. Um mm-hmm. But a perfect picture. This is a nice big fish laid into a trough. Um, you can clearly see the nose is on zero. That's what we want, nose on zero. Zach's holding the fish in place carefully with the strap. You can see this uh, tournament identifier, CCA2. That was the code that Zach was required to submit with fish. Um, so it's not written on his hand. It's not written on his ruler. He's got a, a, little, a little card there. That's common. People can make cards, self-laminate, make a couple of them. That's a tip I have for folks, for sure. Bring a couple out on the boat with you just in case you lose it. Always have a marker with you. And I can see uh, the secret little planer bobber right here that is no longer a secret. Also in the corner, and uh, I just learned that as somebody that gets to judge some of these pictures, I better start looking at tack- tackle a little closer. <laughs> um, you can see Zach also has a, a pair of hemostats here on a bungee, so he can quickly get down into the uh, into the fish's mouth if need be and, and remove a hook. And there's a a pair of grippers as well so all these things are readily available inexpensive to get in the area i'm guessing that this leash right here is probably to his iphone which is probably in a nice case or android whatever in a nice case there so that's a great setup right there uh for folks to look at for a kayak and um you know reality is these uh these catch photo release tournaments using an app like iAngler can be a little complicated um i stopped by uh tockerman's today and i saw uh, the top-notch angler, uh, Tim Campbell, in there uh, working at Tockerman's part-time. And uh, I, I said, Tim, you going to fish the pickerel tournament? He said, Dave, I, I just can't figure out the app. People have tried to help me. I can't figure out the app. And the reality is in the past with some folks that have had those technical challenges, I've actually offered where if they text me the pictures and the details, I'll gladly upload the pictures for them. That's also kind of the, the – um, 
the bat, uh, that's the way that you can, if you're having technical issues, you need some help. You can always reach out to me. You can always send the pictures that way, but you have also a four month period to submit these fish. Um, the, the, the time that you took the picture is what counts, um, for this fish and then the, uh, for this tournament. And then the first person to reach a stringer length is the tiebreaker. So if that stringer is, if Eric, catches a three fish stringer this week with live bait or next week with live bait, like he might. Um, and it's the longest stringer caught in the entire tournament. He wins. Um, even if somebody ties it later in the, in the tournament. So you know, there's value in, in signing up early. I'll be uh, waiting until the end of the tournament. Yeah. You can wait till the last day to duke it out like uh, Lenny and David. Um, but there's value in signing up early. If, I haven't really said it yet, but it's been on our posts and stuff. It's below, uh, sliding at the bottom of the screen there. Even if you're not going to fish till December, like Lenny said, sign up before midnight on Halloween. We'll send out the information for folks that are um, going to be fishing Monday morning, November 1st, so they'll have their identifiers. Um, but there's no risk in signing up now if you're going to fish later. Um, if something were to happen and you don't get out on the water and you're not going to participate later, we'll give you a refund. You know, Of course, definitely when it comes to the safety factor, but also things change in life. So if you're worried about the, the financial commitment, um, we'll absolutely give you a refund if you're not out there fishing in the tournament. You just request it before going fishing. And again, we want everybody to be safe. So um, we're going to ask for one more tip. Or Go ahead, Lenny. I, well, I want to chime in on this app thing because I found it frustrating too. The iAngler app, sometimes it works great, smooth as silk. Other times it's kind of a pain in the keister. But here's the thing. And, and especially it can be a pain when you're on the eastern shore in the middle of nowhere and service stinks. But here's the thing. If you just get the picture on your phone, you can sort it all out later. Yeah. So it really doesn't have to be a worry. All you got to do is just take the picture. You take the picture of the fish on the ruler, just like you showed with Zach's. I'm stealing the strap idea. That's a great idea. I haven't done that. But you just get the picture of the fish. And then if the app isn't cooperating, it just is not a big deal. Don't worry about it. You can sort it all out later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll say the same. I never submit the day or why I'm fishing. I, I'm fishing. I'm spent too much time doing that. I'll take a photograph, release the fish, save the pics. When I get home, I'll upload it at that point. That way, at my leisure, my time, I'm not rushed and pressured to do it. Yeah, I'm going to show. It's not the best way to do it, but I'm showing my phone. Um, you can see it actually says take, take picture or from gallery. And so... From gallery is you've already taken it with your phone. You can take multiple pictures of the same fish, multiple pictures of all your fish, and turn them in when you get home. Um, and again, it'll be based on the time you take the picture. Um, and so, and then a lot of times throughout the iAngler system, we can actually communicate with you if there's a change in your log. Like in this one, let's say Zach submitted it uh, at 24 inches. Well, it's really 25, 24 and a half. We're going to fix it. We're trying to judge the accurate length of this fish. And the folks that are judging, we're human too. Um, and so if we make a mistake, we want you to let us know. We want it to be an accurate uh, a showing of, of the fish. And everything is open to the public to see what's happening. They can see the pictures on the leaderboard. Um, you just click a little thumbnail image, and there'll be a link to the leaderboard once it's live uh, at the top of the page. And so, again, it's, it's, it's wide open. Um, we want folks to keep each other honest, and um, and really everybody's in it together. Uh, we're glad to be able to... to uh, have ordered the copper trophies are on the way already. So, you know, four different pickerel trophies are available uh, in, in copper and then a, a crappy and then a, and then a perch. And then we've got some other additional prizes. We're going to continue to add to the mix. We can only do that. Thanks to our great sponsors. So I'm going to show them again. Uh, there's more coming in every single day. And like, just like we're giving away the coast of sunglasses for early sign up. Uh, we have product from all of these sponsors available that we're going to throw out there um, periodically throughout the, the tournament, just give out randomly. So it's not just about the biggest fish. Yes, that's where the top prizes come in and the Calcuttas and such. But we're going to give out random prizes based on just catching fish, submitting fish, signing up for the tournament. I know I've got some stuff on the way from Under Armour. Uh, we've got an angle live bait cooler that is just perfect for keeping live bait alive uh, that's been allocated to this event. Uh, and lots of other good stuff from our great sponsors here. So we couldn't do it without them. We can add more. We hope to add more. Uh, we tried to keep our sponsorship levels at a level that's reasonable. And for the different sponsorships, you also get entries into the tournament. So all of that is broken down on the sponsorship tab. 
right over here. I'm going to show you that and then show you the registration. And then we're going to have one more around the room and call it a night. So here's the various sponsorships. Um, you can donate product through an in-kind way. Just say we have product and we want to donate it. If you have a specific way you want us to use it, we're all ears. If you just want to throw it in there and let us give away a random prize or add something to a Calcutta, we can absolutely do that as well. The gold, silver, and bronze is laid out right here, and they do include entries. So three for the gold. Uh, that should oh, two. Two for silver and one for bronze. And so if you're already going to participate anyway and you want to add a little bit extra just to support the event and the cause, you know, we're just trying to give right back to the anglers that participate. This is a small fundraiser for CCA, um, and we couldn't do this without folks that are on this on this podcast tonight and some of the great sponsors. So my contact information is here if you want to discuss a custom sponsorship. But otherwise, you just fill out this information, and we will update the website to, uh, to show that you've supported it. Um, and again, I mentioned in the beginning, it's $50 if you're an active member of CCA, meaning you, your membership is not expired. Um, if you just got your Tide magazine recently, you're a current member, um, but it's always good to go to our membership page and check it out and make sure that you're current. Um, if you're not sure, you don't really care, and you just want to add on another 12 months, go ahead and you select the $75 option. If not, you select 50. So let's just say, okay, the 75, you hit the next button. Um, you can now add the different Calcuttas for $10 each. So let's just add longest bass. And then you go and check out. And so it's just like any other online store. You'll receive an auto email when you register. That includes a coupon code. That coupon code will take you to the Pickerel Tournament page on iAngler. You actually enter that coupon code. I'm logged in, so I can't show you live, but you'll click a button here. It'll say register. At the next point, it may look like it's trying to get more money out of you, but you're going to enter that coupon code that you got. So you'll get one as a sponsor. You'll get one as an individual. There's also the coupon code for youth, which is just youth. And as I explained earlier, if you have a youth angler participating with you, and it says on our website, um, you can connect them to your adult account just by contacting me, and our youth are free if they get a free uh, CCA membership. So, Lenny, you're first. One more tip for anybody out there that wants to get out there and have some fun. All right. Well, if you're going to do the old school minnow bobber wobble wobble thing, you're going to be tempted to run three lines. When you're drifting the boat, you can cast one left, cast one right, cast one down the middle. When you're trolling the boat, you can put one down the middle, put a couple down the sides. I learned the hard way. You get a good pickerel on and you got three lines out, there will be a massive tangle involved. So my final tip is if you're going to fish the minnow bobber gig, uh, limit yourself to two lines and just stop there. More is going to be a disaster, frankly. All right, David. Um, to get me and come back, I had it. I just lost it. <laughs> hey, uh, I guess two quick things. Uh, one back to Lenny with the recording things. I'm going to uh, try to, get some uh, salinity data on the creeks and uh, try to crack or try to track the salinity in my catches uh, over the winter. So that'll, that'll be definitely interesting. So kind of a tip there, but uh, one last tip was uh, don't ignore the end of docks. Uh, like especially in the winter time, a little bit deeper uh, along some channels. They'll be hanging out around the end of docks as well. All right. Eric? Yeah, these are um, pickerel are pretty slippery. So um, a good idea is to get yourself a, a measuring device that's uh, concave like Zach had, where the fish can sit down aside. Because if you use a flat one, they're going to want to slip off all the time. And I find it's hard to hold them flat on there. So if you have access to one that folds up, opens up, and it's a concave, the fish can fit down aside there easily. And all also, also okay. Zach, Zach likes to throw minnows at you. So Dave and I have to deal with that several times, especially in the rain. So it's raining and it's raining minnows too. So that, that's that's why Zach didn't end up in the top three or whatever. Is because Zach spends half his time fishing, chasing us around, throwing minnows at us. <laughs> uh, 
I did remember my tip, and I think this is a good one actually that not many people will think of. So we all want to get the big pickerel. We also want to get you know the big crappie, and a lot of these mill ponds have some big crappie in them. Um, if you put out a rod, you know your bobber minnow setup, and you've got a small minnow tipped for crappie, make sure that that setup can handle the biggest pickerel you've ever seen. Because that's how I like that you'll catch a big fish on it. It's just bound to happen. I think I caught my second biggest fish last year on 12 pound tests and it was not fun. Um, so don't be afraid to gear it up a little bit because I mean, I still call it the big, I call it the really big crappie still. And I stopped losing the pickerel on my smaller rod, which was pretty important. Well, I would argue that it was probably a lot of fun because you got to beat dad. That, big oh, that was probably the best part <laughs> <laughs> well we'll see what happens this year with with the the rudo competition yeah. well the, the, best thing, side the best thing about this whole tournament if you ask me is and, and this was originally zach told it told me before i ever got involved in it he said the coolest thing about the winter pickerel championship is you end up going fishing all winter long you don't really think about it it's just like Oh, I'm going pickerel fishing. And and you just do it. It's just this kind of background motivation that you don't even really realize is there until you look back and you go, man, that was a great month. And I went fishing six times in the middle of the winter. <laughs> pickerel tournament's on, you know? It's actually just a great motivator. It's fun fishing. I had some of my best days fishing this year in January, pickerel fishing. And I've been... Mm -hmm. I've had some a great year fishing, so that really says something. So you see the smile face on some of those fish, man. <laughs> Grinning ear to ear. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for being part of this tonight and being part of this event. We couldn't do these tournaments without the participants. And this year I just can't thank the folks that have stepped up to be, you know, idea people, but also see things through and step up and sponsor and support this event. Like I said, registration is open until the last day. Uh, we welcome any sponsors that have creative ideas. We have some new ones on board already and have some more coming in. Uh, we want to continue to promote this fishery because it is so much fun. And there are 365 days of fishing available in Maryland. I don't think tomorrow is going to be one of them or as this weather comes in. So, again, everybody be safe. Uh, realize that there are some there's some threatening weather on the way. So um, stay home, uh, catch up on work and uh, and leave the fishing for the better days. And uh Heck, I hope to see some of you on the water this winter. I've already um, penciled in a date, and hopefully the weather works out in December to get out there and, and have some fun. And I'd like to fish with all of you on the screen and, and anybody else out there. So enjoy yourselves. And again, thank you, everybody, for your support. Uh, don't forget to sign up before midnight, October 31st, Halloween. And uh, even if you don't, that's okay. You can sign up anytime after that. You'll miss a chance for Costas. And heck, you'll be in the running for another prize. We've got some great stuff lined up, and we're going to surprise you with it. Uh, so the, the people that sign up early are going to have the best chance of winning some things thanks to our great sponsors and donors. So thank you all for your your, uh, your time tonight, and let's have some fun out there and be safe. Thanks. Be safe. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, thank guys. You.